Got it. Okay. Well, welcome. Welcome. Happy Friday. I'm really excited. This is one of my favorite workshops that we've put together. Uh, it's Let's Talk AAC, Parents and Professionals Working Together. I am Laura Martinez. I'm the Assistive Technology Program Manager. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Ortega, Assistive Technology Coordinator at TASC. Uh, TASC is a nonprofit. We serve six counties in Southern California. We are a parent training and information center and a family empowerment center. We educate and empower people with disabilities and their families to become effective communicators and self-advocates. Our disclaimer, TASC staff are not advocates or attorneys. We do not provide recommendations, legal advice, or suggestions. Our family support specialists offer peer-to-peer -peer support, information, and options to parents of children with disabilities so they can become informed members of the IEP and work collaboratively with schools. Our family support specialists help families understand the special education process by providing one-on-one -on -one phone consultations, virtual IEP consultations, and review of documentation. They also offer assistance with letter writing, a variety of educational webinars, support, support for military families, information, and resources. Within our tech center, we offer a variety of assistive technology webinars, individualized online appointments. that are one hour long if you're looking for specific apps, websites, Chrome extensions for your children or your clients. Feel free to schedule an appointment with us and we'll show you what we have in the areas that you're looking for. We also offer assistive technology consultations, clinics. Under our AEC services, AEC is Augmentative and Alternative Communication. We have Project Communicate in which we offer a free one hour AEC consultation, virtual consultation with, a, with our contracted speech language pathologist. Let's Talk AEC is our AEC trainees of four webinars, this being one of them. Tech Connection is our online social and life skills group for ages 14 and above. We have a lot of information and resources in assistive technology. Tech Tick Bits is our monthly assistive technology focus e-newsletter. If you're not receiving and would like to receive it, please visit the website on the slide, plug in your name, email address, and you'll start receiving it the following month. Feel free to contact either Laura or myself if you're looking for assistive technology or have specific questions pertaining to your child or clients. These are our email addresses. And before Laura continues, I do want to let you know you will receive a copy of the entire presentation along with additional resources. I will e send the email after the webinar to the email address you used to register to attend today. Thank you, Liz. Okay, uh, I'm gonna let you know this webinar is packed full of information. So again, like Liz said, you'll be getting the handouts um, to refer to along with a lot of additional resources. So um, let's get started. So when we're looking at augmentative and alternative communication, we want to make sure that that AAC is person-centered. So we're gonna start with that area. So I'm gonna start with this quote that I love. AAC users need to be involved to the greatest extent possible in decision-making making, programming of their device picking icons and everything else connected to their AAC. And uh, Dana Nieder said that in uh, the 2018 AAC in the Cloud keynote address. So we're gonna talk about personalization first. So how important it is and what the things to think about. So you need to think about the language system that you're gonna use. And of course, this will be decided excuse me, during an assistive or an augmentative alternative communication assessment or evaluation, 
done by a speech language pathologist who understands AAC. There are many different types of language systems and it's really important that um, it, it's the language system is matched to the user. So you're going to also consider languages spoken. Do you want uh, a system, whether it's paper-based, low-tech, mid-tech, or high-tech? Do you want it to have um, the capability for multiple languages? You need to look at the access method, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. But basically, can they point and directly se select what they want? Or do you need to look at an alternative alternative method for access? Motor planning. So this is really important. So the way I like to um, explain it is if you are all type and use a keyboard, the standard QWERTY layout is what you get used to and you learn where the keys are and you know what to look for. If somebody took those keys and just mixed them all up, it would be a lot harder for you to type because you would have to visually scan to try to find those letters. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but motor planning is super important because you want your, um, your go-to words, your core words, your words that you use all the time to be in relatively the same location. So that becomes rote, you know, you just automatic. Otherwise, trying to scan and look for a word can be really frustrating and, of course, take a lot of time. You want to make sure you're adding user-specific words and phrases. Uh, this can, of course, be super important um, well, for all ages because you want to have things that they need to say. You want to have things they're interested in, uh, topics they're interested in. And one of my favorite buttons or things that I believe should be on every system is I something different. I want something different. I don't want orange juice or water. I want something different, or I don't want this activity or that activity. So um, adding things like that. Uh, making sure the icons reflect the AAC user. So many of the vendors, thankfully, are adding different icons that more genuinely reflect the AAC user. Um, nationalities, skin colors. Um, we have one here in a wheelchair. There are many with mobility devices. You know, gender, there's all different things that um, are Im important in not only the icons, but the voices as well. Using actual photos versus icons. Many people do just great with icons. They relate that this is a cookie just as well as this is a cookie. But sometimes when you're starting out, somebody may prefer or be more drawn to actual photos. And when we're talking about actual photos, um, those can be of specific people or places or desired activities. So here we have a little girl jumping on a trampoline. Uh, one of my favorite things when we're starting out in AAC or any kind of um, activity, even visual schedules, if the user, if you're able to take pictures of them doing that activity, especially for kiddos, a lot of them really like to see themselves doing the activity. And then when you're talking about specific people, maybe you're talking about someone's grandpa and um, maybe their grandpa doesn't look like any of the icons. Maybe they want an actual picture of their grandpa. So just, just things to think about. Another thing that's really important is the communication setting. So where are they gonna be using this AAC? obviously anywhere they need to talk, but is going to be home, the workforce, school, out in the community, um, hopefully all of those things. Also why, which seems like, um, you know, but obviously for language functions, requesting, protesting, informing, 
but also uh, maybe for uh, social reasons, getting their feelings across. There's all different different reasons for communication. And then you need to look at what kind of vocabulary you'll need. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes, but four words, those are words, well, actually 80% of the words you use in your daily vocabulary, everyone is core words. And those are words like I, do, want, stop, put, go like things like that and then there are topic specific or some people call them fringe vocabulary examples so those are more uh, situation specific so i have a couple examples here eating lunch does the communication system have the word straw or napkin or things that they need for that situation uh, in addition to those core words like like and don't like. Um, and at the doctor, does the system have symbols for body parts, pain levels, other medical terms that may be needed? And we're going to look at some examples in just a sec. Told you it was just a sec. Um, so on the left side here, we have a topic specific. It's um, a board for medical. And I really like this one because not only does it have the, the body parts that you can point to, but it has the different types of pain. Is it a sharp pain, a dull pain, a stabbing? Um, pain scale and different words um, that you may need. Another topic specific vocabulary board here is obviously for eating. So in the middle you have food choices and drink choices. And then on the sides, you have um, the more core vocabulary. I love that they have yum and yuck. Um, I'm not hungry. Um, something different, again, I think is really important. Maybe they don't want any of the items list listed, and they should be able to have that choice. And for um, well, we'll talk about it in a little bit for, but for every communication system, it's good to have access to a keyboard. So if a word isn't there, they can spell out what they want. <clears throat> Here are two more topic specific vocabulary situations. The one on the left is for ordering at McDonald's, obviously different choices here, sizes, condiments, different things. My choice isn't here. They want something else. On the right here, we have an iPad with the Avaz app, and they have a recipe app and things they're going to be cooking. So topic specific and situation specific. Here's another one. Here's a Mr. Potato Head, um, and I put a link here. Any if there are free links at all possible, I put them in your handouts or in the in the presentation. Um, so this is a link here to Teachers Pay Teachers, which has a ton of free products. You do have to register, but it's free. Um, but this is requesting parts for a potato toy. Um, and again, that's very topic specific and it can look different depending on their communication system. So core versus fringe, we talked about that a few minutes ago. So core again is, it's a small number of words, but it's used for most uh, things that you talk about. And then it's usable, usable across all situations and cultures and applicable to all ages. When you get to fringe or activity specific words, it's a huge number, but they're mostly nouns or user specific vocabulary. So our example here is, can we go to Starbucks to get a latte? And here's our core words in green and um, our fringe words in red. Excuse me. So 
So here are just a couple examples of core boards. The one on the left can be downloaded here at this link. ACE Center, which is on your long list of resources that you'll be getting, has a lot of free boards that you can download. This is uh, one with high contrast symbols. And then the one on the left is a standard core board uh, with your words that you're probably going to use throughout the day, many of them. And you'll have links to download lots of core boards. So really quickly, I wanted to do a short activity if you guys are game. So here's a core board. And I want you to type in the chat, how many two to three word phrases can you make with this core board? Um, bonus happy points for uh, four or five word phrases. But if you guys would type in the chat and give it a shot. I want more, great. That's right on the first line there, right? I need the bathroom, my turn, thank you. I need help. I need help open, please, good. Yep, bathroom's important. You know, they might wanna tell you they're done, I'm done. I wanna go goodbye, yep. Get me out of here. Um, so there's all kinds of things that you can say with just this tiny amount of words. In contrast, if you're giving somebody a board with just nouns, there's not a lot you can say. You know, horse, cow, piano isn't really a sentence, right? They're just making choices. Great, thank you guys. Sorry, my mouse is sticking. Okay, we're gonna get into AAC goals just a little bit. And of course, most of you probably have heard the term SMART for goals. Um, so your goals, when you're looking at um, IEP goals should be always specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and then time bound. When is this gonna be done by? So I found this checklist and I, I put the link in here for you, put together by Lauren Enders. Uh, Practical AAC is a great website. It is in your um, handouts. So does this AAC goal matter? So these are just things to think about. So does the goal have relevance to the child both now and in the future? Is the purpose of this goal clear to both the child and the instructors? Will accomplishing the goal lead to autonomous communication? what we all want, right? Will accomplishing the goal lead to increased access to communication? Will accomplishing this goal lead to increased communicative competence? And does the, the goal address skills that make the communicator happier or more independent, which independence is what we really want. Happy's good too. So I put some AAC goal examples in here, but I wanted to point out this link on Speechy Mussings. They do have a goal bank. I'm gonna click and hope we go. Ta-da. Um, so they have a speech language therapy goal bank. Um, so they have language goals. So they have vocabulary, AAC goals. 
and then other things like that. So I just wanted to point out, and then we'll look at um, a couple of these. I just put them in here as an example for you. Sorry, my mouse keeps, okay. So given, and then you want to insert the supports, whatever their um, supports that are needed are. So is it access to their robust AAC, you know, their communication system? Is it their communication partner? Is it given consistent modeling or sensory supports or indirect, indirect verbal prompts? So given access to their system, Susie, you know, will communicate for whatever the number is, three or more different communicative functions or purposes. There's the examples, greeting others, making comments, requesting, refusing, sharing, labeling, asking, answering questions, et cetera, during a 20 minute or 10 minute or whatever it is, activity or other time period in a school day. So they really need to be specific and measured is um, what I'm trying to get across. Thank you. That is a great resource. I was so excited when I found it. Um, there's a couple other ones here. I'll just skip to the bottom. Given one indirect verbal cue, so-and-so will combine two or more symbols to make requests in 70% of opportunities during routine or semi-structured activities. So this is just stuff I want to think about and pass along these um, great resources. Now, here are two forms that really help, especially for um, not only for the whole IEP team, but especially for whoever's implementing the AAC or doing even um, the AAC assessment. So the first one is very simple, short and very simple. It's again, got that SMART across the top, goals for AAC. And it's just a fillable form. And again, I do have the links here for both of the forms. Um, what do we hope to achieve and why? We're gonna work to re uh, reach this goal by when? And then what steps are we gonna take to help us get there? So what are our objectives that are gonna lead to that goal? And then who's gonna be involved in this step? And then you're going to check it off, whether it's been accomplished or not. And then there's notes for a progress check. And this was actually by um, a company called Cough Drop, and they have tons of great resources. Uh, the other one is called the DAG2, and it's actually uh, by Toby Dynavox, which is an AAC vendor. And it is quite an involved form. It's huge. Um, I won't go through the whole thing, but it does take you through. Let me open and see how quickly or not quickly it will open. Dun, dun, dun. So, so DAG is the Dynamic AAC Goals Grid. So it's um, a lot of pages, <laughs> but I wanted to show you, let's make that bigger so we can actually see it. Okay, so it takes you through, starting with the ability level, are they emergent communicators, emergent transitional, and it goes through understanding, expression, social interactions, literacy, and other things. I don't want to give you, get you guys seasick from scrolling. And are they context dependent? Are they transitional independent? So after ability level, and what I love is it's, you can just check and write notes. It's a fillable form. So it's really, really um, long, a long form, but it's very, very, very detailed. So I have the link there for you to actually to both of those. So AAC etiquette. From working with friends over the years, uh, AAC speakers, I've learned a lot. Uh, a lot of these things are, 
are available online, the etiquette, but I went through and I asked of two of our um, adult AAC users, what was the most important? So talking to the user, not the device or the person with them. This happens a lot and you really wanna directly communicate with the person. Uh, please don't ask a question and walk away. This happens more than you think. You have, patience is, I think, the number one learned skill um, for a communication partner, which we'll, we'll go through that later on. But um, just be patient and wait for them to compose what they're trying to do. Allow extra time for the person who uses AAC to communicate. Um, be aware that communicating um, with a device or with a system takes longer than actually speaking with your voice. Be patient and listen respectfully. Don't ask quick fire questions. Um, I have been guilty of this in the past where you just keep asking questions and they're still trying to answer the first question. So just one question at a time until they're done. And then this depends on the communicator, but don't start guessing what they're gonna say unless it's a familiar user that you know prefers that method. Uh, being honest, letting people know that you don't understand what they're trying to communicate. This can be with someone that's using any kind of communication system, someone that's speaking to you with a speech that's maybe dysarthric. You need to be honest and communicate and just try again. Keep trying until you figure out what they're saying. Um, presuming competence, I'm sure you guys know this, but avoid talking down or talking unnecessarily loudly. I've seen this and heard from uh, my AAC speaking friends over the years that people tend to shout at them and their um, hearing is typically fine. So uh, not everyone that has a speech impair impairment or who's in a wheelchair has trouble hearing or understanding what you're saying. And then respecting personal space. Um, please don't read over their shoulder or try to anticipate their questions unless there's someone who prefers that method. Feel free to ask questions in the chat that pertain to what we're talking about. If you have something specific um, about your child or a specific client, please feel free to email us and again, we'll give you our info again. And we'll be super glad to help you out. So talking about collaboration, I liked this team. Together, everyone achieves more. So... Collaboration leads to continuity. And obviously our common goal is individualized person-centered AAC for each communicator. You know, it's not a cookie cutter, one size fits all situation ever. Everyone is so different. So in order to do this, we, we need to implement AAC throughout the day, whether, whether it's at school, home, therapy, the doctor, the community, in all situations. And obviously collaborating is a key objective to, to achieving this goal. So in order to do this, we need to communicate with each other, which I'll talk about in just a, a few seconds. And also of course, with our AAC speakers. You need to know the AAC system that's involved, whether it's a paper system, a mid-tech system or a high-tech system, you need to know the system in order to be able to help. Um, we need to allow our communicators that time to learn that system. AAC is like a foreign language. They need to learn where the buttons are, learn what folders things are in, and how to navigate that system, and that takes time. Um, Oh, allow our communicators time to learn that system. Like I said, it's really, really important. Uh, make sure we're all on the same page regarding goals and objectives. And I'll talk about ways to do that in just a minute. 
And then using similar methods for teaching, implementing, and opportunities to learn is important as well. So as a team, talk about that, try to decide, come up with a plan, and this is how we're going to do this. Okay. So you may have heard the term communication partner or communication assistant. And this is kind of what the difference is. Um, so a communication partner is an individual with whom we interact. So that's basically any of us, I'm talking to you or whoever I'm talking to is my communication partner and vice versa. So this might be a member of the family, a friend, a professional, a doctor, you know, um, you know, a colleague, um, somebody in the community could be anyone. Um, and like I said, everyone on earth has a communication partner or multiple communication partners. Um, partners, as the word indicates, you're equal in that interaction. You're having an interaction in whatever way um, you communicate. And you're gonna respond appropriately to that AAC user's messages. You're gonna talk to that AAC user and that role does not change over time. When you're talking about a communication assistant, it's someone who helps us interact successfully and independently. So, Often a paraprofessional or an assistant, if the AAC user is a student or a familiar person, like a family member or caregiver, could be that communication assistant. And um, sometimes people who have challenges, whether they're physical, you know, like motoric or cognitive, whatever the challenges are, sometimes they need communication assistance. Um, they're typically people who are familiar and trained on the communication system, and they are there to support the interaction only. So they might be someone who's going to help hold their, support their hand to help them type, or there might be somebody to point at where the icon is, things like that. Um, they're going to help that AAC user produce appropriate messages, might be prompting, um, and that role is hopefully going to decrease as the AAC speaker becomes more independent. So neither talks for the AAC speaker, both give the AAC speaker a chance to be as independent as possible. So we're going to watch two videos. And then I'm going to have you comment whether you think they're a communication partner, a communication assistant, or both. Now, happy to tell mama. Our plan is something to say. More to say. I like this. It's funny. Oh my goodness. It's funny. Back to page one. Oh, more to say. Let's go. Turn the page. made a mistake. Should we go back a page? Look. Let's go outside activity. Outside activity. Turn the page. The sandbox. Oh, I have something to say. No, I have something to say. Uh-oh. Oh, no. That was, oops, made a mistake, I think. That was a oops made a mistake. More to say. <laughs> I like this. Funny. I have something to say. Back to page one. You are funny. You are funny. Angela's fussing. Let's be finished. Angela. Okay. So. 
was Harper's mom a communication partner or a communication assistant or both? Michelle says both. Anyone else? Rocio says both. Maya says assistant. Ashley says assistant. Partner. Good. Okay. So in this video, I think that she could be considered both. She is her communication partner, um, mostly because they're talking, but she does need to assist Harper with a couple things. They're using the pod system and she does turn the page and do things like that. But, part, uh, but Harper is definitely pointing to what she wants. So yeah. Now we're gonna watch this little guy. What did you have for breakfast? Breakfast? Milk. What else? Yogurt, eggs. <gasps> Milk, yogurt, and eggs, you're right. You're right. What are you gonna have for supper? Milk. Yeah, you kind of say it now, can't you? Food. Mac and cheese. <gasps> Now, how come you're going to have mac and cheese? What do you have to do? Can you show me on there? I need help. Potty. <gasps> you have to go potty? And then you can get macaroni and cheese, huh? What are we going to do after you go potty? I need help. Wash my hat. Yeah, we're going to wash We're gonna wash and dry your hands. Pick yeah. me up. Yeah, and we'll pick you up. And help you on and off the potty. Put me down. Yep, we'll clean it. Tie my shoe. Okay. Okay, what about this guy? I think it's, whoops. Gosh darn it, what did I do? Okay, I think it's a little more clear on this one. What do you guys think? Yeah, definitely, definitely a partner. She's just asking him questions and he's just, jamming on his communication device and answering them. Yep. Good. Good. A lot of times those lines can be blurred and that's okay, uh, especially with beginning communicators or people who need support. Um, but yeah, you guys got, got that, definitely. So being a supportive communication partner um, these are just kind of tips. You're in this together. Um, communicating with someone who's using AAC is that shared responsibility. And again, that first step is being prepared to change your communication style to achieve that the best interaction with the person you're communicating with. And then appreciating your partner's work. You know what? Communicating verbally is easy for most of us. Communicating on an AAC system um, involves learning a lot of new skills and it does take time. So respect the effort. Maybe they didn't say um, the sentence exactly right, but you got the gist of it. Or even just the effort to point to, even if they hit the wrong button, they're trying. And then setting the stage, this isn't always possible, but if possible, try to get rid of the background noise and reduce glare on the device. Uh, sometimes with the higher tech devices, when you're outside, the sunshine can be brutal and it can be really hard to see um, the folders and the words that you're trying to use. Um, and then this is the most important thing. Again, I'm gonna stress this because boy, I really had to learn this the hard way. Wait, wait, and wait, and then wait some more. Um, so I like st statistics. An average verbal communicator can easily say 150 words in one minute. An average AAC user can produce about 15 words in a minute. So that's a huge difference. So just keep remembering that that communicating on a device takes time or any kind of system. 
and just be prepared to slow down, slow the pace of that conversation. So um, Michelle says, it's hard for me. It's a hard for me to do. You keep having to remind yourself just to wait. Yeah, patient is, is uh, being patient is not, does not come easy for me. But over the years, I've really learned to just literally bite my tongue. And in my head, I'm going, just wait, just wait. Yeah. Uh, make sure, again, make sure you understood the user and you can repeat it back. Say, did you mean this? Or I'm not sure I understood that. And um, again, it's really important to, to communicate that you really didn't understand what they were saying. Um, most people will appreciate, most um, AAC communicators will appreciate that you really got what they're trying to say. And if you don't, it's understandable. Um, and then make sure that the partner, your, your partner knows that you really value what they're trying to communicate and you really wanna figure it out. And then you wanna focus again on that person, try not to focus on their technology um, or other things, really try to focus on them. And then ask. Um, if you're not sure if they have something to say or need more time, you can just say, do you have something to say or do you need more time to think about that or to, to write that down? And then don't be afraid of the device. Um, add in fun icons, delete things that aren't helpful or you're, you're never going to use. Um, I say you can't break it. I mean, when you're programming the device, you can't break it. Obviously, you can break it if you throw it down in the street or roll over it with your car. But um, I wanted to point out this website, aphasia.com. It's a company called Lin Graphica, and they have such great um, information and resources. Again, that's on your, um, your handout as well in the the resource section, but I did want to point that out because it's really a great resource. <clears throat> this is more of a reminder or something you may not have thought about. Again, I got this from Cough Drop. Um, so when you're talking about listening, you want to do whole body or active listening. It's much more than just your ears. You want to, of course, your ears are important, but you want to make sure when you're talking with someone and you're um, trying to support that AAC user, that obviously you're listening, but also smiling, biting your tongue and not talking while they're talking. Um, obviously, focus on them. Listening with your hands is primarily about what, what they're not doing. So you don't want to be scrolling through your phone or doing other things. It's just focusing, um, talking to someone like you would anyone else, because that's exactly what it is. And then your body or your posture. So um, facing towards the person and being ready to receive and communicate. Where will I find all these wonderful links? Glad you asked, Michelle. They will be in your handouts that will be sent to you after the webinar. I've included all the links plus um, probably way more than you want or need. I love resources. So what to expect when we're working with AAC? So of course, every individual is different and every user of AAC is also different. These are just things I want you to think about. So Depending on the user, or if you work with multiple users, um, their communication methods are really important. And we're going to talk about access and different things later, but this is just an example of one user. I use my eyes to access a special device mounted on my wheelchair, so they use eye gaze. I giggle and smile when I'm happy, and I look away when I don't like something. I'll raise my hand if I have something to say, please wait for me to take my turn. Things like this, informational things like this are super important. It's really important to get to know each user and um, what their signs are, what they do. 
Another thing to think about, and we'll talk about this, how to keep track of this, is equipment maintenance. So how is the device charged if it's a high-tech device? Is there a backup battery? Um, where's the backup charger? Because there, there will be one day when the device comes home almost dead or comes to school almost dead and the charger was left at school or home, wherever you're not. So you want to always have a backup charger and a backup battery ready to go. Again, how can the device be cleaned? Sometimes things happen. Things get spilled, uh, could be drool, could be a sneezes. You just never know. So you want to find out the safe way to clean that device. Again, really good source, Practical AAC. The links will be directly on your handouts. What to do when something goes wrong? So if it's a high common errors that I can fix easily. With quick reference guides or problem solving. Um, you may need to discuss or have a plan on And then then always um so more studies studies have shown that between twenty seventy five percent of all assistance three years. And here are some of the reasons. Unrealistic expectations of the technology and subse subsequent disappointment. I always try to tell people when we're talking about or showing them technology that this technology is a tool. It's not a magic wand. It's not um, going to cure or fix everything. It's a tool. So realistic expectations are important. And then the, if the device is not adapted to optimize its fit for the user, this happens a lot. It's not generic. It's not cookie cutter. Communication systems especially need to be fit to that user. Um, and then also the technology needs to be adjusted according to changes and growth over time. Limited or one. Please know when you have an AAC or AT. Those recommendations, there needs to be training for the user, for the people involved with that user, whether it's at school or at home or other things. And then lack of, because lack of knowledge of how to use the device leads to that. I don't know how to use it. It's, it's over there. Or handling that. Um, sometimes people don't know where to do that or the supports haven't been put in or they're not provided. Um, I have a friend that's an AAC user that's an adult that has a print key ROMIC device, which she loves. This is like her third device. Uh, it needs to be fixed and her doctor keeps sending um, a prescription to have it sent to another company to have it fixed. Well, they're not going to fix a different vendor's device. And she's going round and round and round with them. So it's really important that people understand how this thing works. Um, often there's a mismatch between the pupil's cognitive ability and the sophistication of the technology. And I don't just mean it's too hard. It could be way too simple as well. Um, Sometimes there's feelings of embarrassment due to unwanted or excessive attention, negative social judgment, 
and then denial of need. I've seen this a lot, especially with adults or teenagers that have never used a communication system that have relied on familiar communication partners to get what they want. Um, have a friend that I've had for gosh, 25 years now. She has very dysarthric speech from cerebral palsy. I can understand her perfectly, um, but I've known her forever. But it took me the longest time to get her to buy in to get a communication device for those times that people don't understand her. So the buy-in is really, really important. Oh no, am I going in and out? Can you hear me okay? Liz? Yes. Okay. So it could be your connection, it could be mine, I apologize. Darn Zoom. Okay, what does device abandonment look like? It can look, look different, but rejecting their AA system, protesting when you're trying to model on it, um, refusing to carry their talker or other system, they just leave it in their backpack, um, protesting when you bring the device out. Uh, Liz and I watched a series of videos in a in a training one day, and there was an older gentleman, not older gentleman, probably early teens, or late teens, early 20s. Um, and every time they brought his talker out, he literally turned and faced his back to it and said, no. Slowly over time, they were modeling on it. Um, even with his back turned and they would say, you know, do you want to do this? Please tell me on the device and then you can, you know, it took a long time, but by the end, carries his device. He loves it. He really jams on that thing. Um, so that protesting when it's brought out, hiding their talker or AAC system, again, turning away from the talker, uh, throwing the talker or the system. I have heard of this happening multiple times with iPads um, and then complete meltdowns. So how we, how to try to avoid this is um, number one is an AAC assessment geared specifically to that user. You want to involve the user or the speaker um, and ensure that they're actively involved in the selection process when um, for the SLPs or whoever's doing the assessments, you know, they're trying different system language systems, they're trying different devices, different layouts. Um, really important that you have that, that user's input as much as possible. Understanding the environment in which they're going to be in and ensure compatibility in that environment. Um, set up orientation training for all team members, including all of these people. Um, and then regular communication between team members. I think this is really important. And I'm just gonna give you a few ideas. Um, and maybe if you have other ideas, I'll have you put them in the chat. Um, these are just examples here, emails, communication log, team meetings, things like this. So who is on Team AAC? So Team AAC can be quite a big group of folks. Uh, in the middle, of course, is the AAC user. That is the center. And then on the family side, you might have caregivers or parents or other people. Um, school partners can include many people, your AAC support, your classroom aide, your teachers, uh, classroom um, peers. And then from both sides, family and school, you have all the therapies, speech, OT, PT, behavior therapy. There could be many more, but lots and lots of people with the AAC user at the center always. So here's just some ideas for team communication and meetings. 
um, just for people within that that team. Um, of course, in person, Zoom, phone calls, emails, group text, communication logs. Um, our speech language pathologist told us with one of her students that um, they actually communicate through the user's device. They have a button that they program, tell what happened or what's going on, and they just keep editing that button, which I thought was a great idea. Um, you want to have clear team responsibilities. I did include um, the link for this um, collaborative teaming matrix. It was put out by the Bridge School, their transition program. Um, yours may look different or you may wanna create your own, but I think it's really important that you have, and this is just part of it, that you have and identify who's responsible for what. Otherwise you get a lot of, well, I thought you were gonna do it. So who is responsible for charging the device? Well, maybe at school, it might be the, the para and at home, it might be a parent or whatever that looks like. Who's gonna troubleshoot the problems? Who's gonna contact technical support? Who's gonna back that device up you know, regularly? Things like that. Um, in programming the AAC device, who's gonna program the device and design orientation? Probably your AAC specialist, but should have in, input um, from the user, from the people on the team. Um, who's going to identify the new messages to be added? And who's going to, I think this is a really good, good one, who's going to alert the team members to new vocabulary? So, hey, we added these things on today, and this is where they're located, that type of a thing. And then who's gonna create visual supports? So here's just an example, and we have a few more of these when we get into implementation of a participation plan for teaching tools. In this case, it would be, um, of course, AAC. So just the different um, columns. So what activity or when are we gonna use it? What equipment and tools are we going to use? So for this one, they're going to use a step-by-step, -step, which is a single, like a button system, and a comment board. What's the student going to be doing? Well, they're going to greet their reading partner with the step-by-step. -step. The paraprofessional is going to record the greeting on the step-by-step -step and make it available for the student to access. For the comment board, the student's going to use the, the comment board to say what they think about her breakfast or her lunch or whatever that is. And then um, this is how the adult's going to facilitate it. So things like this are really important too. And we're going to give you some of those tools in a bit. Whew, I know it's a lot. How are we doing? Does anybody have um, questions about what we've already talked about? All right, I'm going to keep going. Okay, access methods. So depending on someone's um, physical abilities, um, you know, their motor functions, uh, people might need um, something other than just pointing with their finger. Um, they might need a head stick, a mouth stick, a light pointer, depending on them. And then they might have a different yes or no, a click, um, a head nod, things like that. So when we're talking about direct access, we're talking about direct selection, which can be um, actually touching, could be using eye gaze. You could be using a pointing device like a head pointer or a mouth stick. I'm going to show you a couple of those things in just a moment. But there's also indirect access for those who can't um, physically access things themselves. And we're going to show you partner assisted scanning. It's a very quick video. Yeah. All right, Kylie, what do you want? More? Stop? Go. Oh, I heard you say go. Okay, let me switch to my places and so you can tell me where you want to go. Did you want to go to the pool, school, 
grocery, library, mall. I heard you click for mall. Mall, you want to go to the mall? Okay, let's go. Oops, close this out too. Geez, I just have all of them open, huh? Okay. Okay, so that was indirect access. That was um, partner-assisted scanning. There's many different ways to do that, but I just wanted to give you an idea. There's all different ways um, that you can access, and that, of course, needs to be looked at when doing the AAC assessment. Okay, Michelle, please email us and we'll try to see if we can help you out. So here's some different access methods. So my friend Tim types with his toes. His communication device is mounted on his on a footboard of his wheelchair. Um, next to it is his um, joystick that he uses to um, move his wheelchair. This is my friend Rick. He actually invented this pointing device. And so he uses a communication device and he has it pointed down and uses it below his chin so he can see what he's pointing to. But he's also an artist. And so this actually flips up and this changes direction and it comes up above overhead where he can attach a paintbrush and then he can paint with that. Again, this is direct selection. This is a pencil somebody took, broke in half, put into a piece of P PVC pipe so someone can gr grasp onto it and point that way. Again, this is eye gaze, and then this is switch access with their head. So there's all different ways. There's way more ways than that, but definitely um, ways to do that. And then Michelle, going back to your um, your question, she says we're in desperate need for something to hold his device while in his wheelchair, car seat, et cetera. I've tried purchasing through Amazon and nothing holds it correctly. Um, I'm going to have you email me, but I would just ask you um, where you got the assessment, how they decided what that device was, and if they um, they uh, thought about that or if you can go back to that person and say hey do you have any ideas for mounting but um I can help you or I can try to help you just go ahead and email me and I'll help you or try <laughs> okay implementation you're very welcome so implementation um I'm going to point these guys out later but in case I don't there's a great um um, woman, and she's created all these great um, clip art items. You can find her at Drawn to AAC on Instagram, but she has so many wonderful um, clip art packs that you can buy that have all different kinds of communication devices. And she, for a fee, um, pretty pretty low fee will actually create personalized ones as well, which is really, really neat. So I just wanted to plug her. I thought, I think it's really cool. So looking at implementation planning. So in order to support students who, or people who use AAC and having them be successful communicators, um, implementation should be a dynamic process. So it should, should be ever changing. Um, and that's going to consider the student or person, whoever we're talking about, their communication partners, their communication environment, their requirements, and the complexity of whatever their communication system looks like. So ways to support, I have student, but could it be a, a person too, um, should be reviewed often and changed as needed in order to increase that communication autonomy. And so we already talked about this, but you want to establish those clear goals. You want to prepare that environment and make sure it's a positive communication environment. 
Using implementation and planning documents are great and they should be dynamic and editable so that you can change them as needed as that communication grows and as just different things change. Again, you wanna establish those team roles and responsibilities. And then again, the training. I'm gonna harp on training because it's really, really important. And um, I put my source here. There's a lot of good information on this Google site. And again, it's clickable. So here are a couple examples of implementation plans. Um, the one on the left, I do have a link for, and that's just the, the top part of it, but this is a communication implementation plan. So you're going to put in your activities, your IEP goals, whatever it is, what the expectations are, what the vocabulary or skill is that you're targeting, and then what adult supports so that you have those, they're established and clear. This one, unfortunately, I took a picture of, but I could not find a link to it, but it's something that really could be created simply. This is from Bucks County Schools, but um, something really simple. So who's gonna make sure the communication system is accessible? What's needed for that system to be accessible? So this one's all about access, but you could put anything in there that you wanted to, depending on um, the goals and what you need to do to implement that communication. This I just love. It's by it's simple AAC and it's by Smartbox Technologies. Um, I have it in a printout that I just put up, but basically um, just to remind me, so the word simple AAC, the acronyms, show, make sure you're pointing to symbols as you talk so you can model that language. Keep things interesting, motivating, fun, right? Make sure things are learning is based on the communicator's interests. Months and months. So learning AAC takes a lot of time. Just keep modeling. Don't worry if the person is not using the AAC right away. Like I said, it's a learned language. Those pauses, make sure you're giving those, those communicators lots of time. You're gonna pause to show them that it's their turn to talk. Try counting to 10 in your head. Um, language. So you're going to teach different types of words, describing words, action words, not just things, not just nouns. Think about those core words and then go from there. Um, you have to, for Explore, you really need to give the learners, the AAC users, time to explore their device and babble. Just like a young child babbles when they're learning to talk, the same thing can be done with an AAC device. Just let them punch words, see where everything is. Maybe, um, you know, maybe they're trying to um, construct a sentence and maybe they're just trying to figure out what's going on. And then you always wanna make that communication system available, no matter what it is. If it's a communication board, if it's a button, if it's a high-tech device, you wanna make it always available. Um, I think about it as if, what if somebody just put tape over your mouth and said, okay, you can't talk during this activity. So you want to make sure they're always, always able to communicate. And then you want to keep adding words. So if they say one word, you're going to repeat it back with another word. So if they say cookie, you're going to say, want a cookie? And then if they say want cookie, they're going to say, do you want a cookie? You know, you're going to keep wanting to add um, to expand those sentences. And then commenting. Try not to ask questions that you know the answer to or yes or no questions. You, <laughs> you want to make sure you're asking questions that they can actually answer with their preferences or opinions. And then you want to comment on what's happening. Oh, really? You like dogs? I like dogs too. This is another quote. Kata Hearn is one of my favorite AAC folks. 
Um, she speaks at many conferences. Again, this is from AAC in the cloud. If you don't know about it and you're interested, um, you can Google it or we can, maybe Liz can put the link in the chat, but it's a yearly conference that's all online, all about AAC and completely free. It's wonderful. And I love that if you miss any of the sessions, you can go back and watch them later. So um, little plug for that. But back to Kate. So um, learning a robust AAC, a robust system on AAC is just like learning any other language. If you want to learn a communication device, your best bet is to be totally immersed in that communication device. So you need to make the environment an environment that's only that speaks that language. The only way to become fluid fluent is to live that language. And so we know this for other languages, but you need to think that way about AAC as well. Thank you, Liz, for putting that in the chat. Great conference. So how do we all learn? Well, we learn by modeling. Excuse me. So research, here's my research again. Research indicates that it takes between two and 10,000 observations for a typically developing child to acquire a language structure. And we need to expect the same from students using AAC. Um, modeling different communicative functions repeatedly, requesting, greeting, responding. Um, some For some folks, if you have a separate but identical device, if it's possible, modeling on your own device so that they can use theirs is one way to go, or you can model on their device if it's okay with them. So here's a little bit about how to model language. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start the video.
Okay. I like that video. So um, just ideas for modeling uh, language. Uh, so here's, here's uh, another thing. So here's an example of modeling language with a specific topic. So hopefully by the pictures, picture, you can tell what they're doing, but you want to point to and select symbols on the communication system as you talk. And again, you don't need to choose a symbol for every word you say. Um, I'm going to demonstrate, well, she's going to demonstrate this, but then I am too. Um, if someone's not yet using their AAC system, you might want to model one or two keywords per sentence. So, um, ooh, we're going to make s'mores. Ooh, I can't wait to eat them, pointing to eat. Um, and then again, if someone's beginning to use their system one symbol at a time, you might want to model two or three, just a couple steps ahead. Hi guys, welcome to today's video. Today's video, we are going to talk about AAC and cooking. And so for today's cooking activity, we will be putting together and making some s'mores. So first let's talk about what we need to make s'mores. We need graham crackers. We need chocolate we need marshmallows hey. yeah Ma? we need sticks or you can have like hot dog sticks like we've got and we also need a fire to roast our marshmallows what is the first thing that we're gonna do we are going to put our marshmallows on the sticks and we will go cook them over the fire. Okay, the video is kind of long. I just wanted to show you how she's pointing to one, one or two things at a time. So um, I don't know if you've heard the term, speaking of s'mores, if you've heard the term s'mores, s'mores is an acronym. And so I'm gonna go through what the letters stand for. So the first, so the S in s'more stands for slow rate. So you want to speak in a slow, not too slow, but a slow, clear manner, while at the same time pointing to or touching one or more of the words you say on the, the communication system like she did. Um, the MO stands for model. So you want to verbally speak while also pointing or touching to the words on the AAC learner's communication device or system. And um, <laughs> imagine you're adding closed captions to a silent movie. So again, we're gonna eat, you know, s'mores. The R stands for respect and reflect. So when the AAC communicator or learner communicates something through gestures, vocalizations, behaviors, or any means other than their communication system, you're gonna try to respect that communication attempt and reflect on their in intended message by modeling a word or phrase to communicate the same message. Don't make them repeat. So you might wanna say, um, yeah, we need graham crackers. Let's get the graham crackers, you know. The other R stands for repeat. So you're going to use utterance, utterances repeatedly. So use words repeatedly, but with a variety to teach different uses and meanings of the word or the phrase. And then expand is our E. Um, build upon that AAC learner's communication attempts and be mindful that you don't overwhelm them. And S is for stop. Again, it's that um, providing that expectant pause and giving the AAC user an opportunity to communicate using their system. And again, you wanna wait with anticipation for at least 10 seconds. Some people may need longer to compose a message to invite communication from that AAC user. 
processing what you have said, formulating a response, and initiating that response through their communication device takes time. If the AAC uh, learner does not take a turn, don't require them to communicate. Just move on and resume the modeling. It can take time. So just to remember the acronyms, slow speech rate, model, respect and reflect, repeat, and expand. And you got, and then stop, of course, and you've got your, your s'mores there. Okay, we're gonna do an activity. Um, when saying the following sentences verbally, think about which core words, and here's a core word board, would you model? So like we were just talking about. So for number one, I would say, look over there, look. What about, do you want to go to the zoo? Anybody type in chat what they would think you would be modeling on the core board? Go. Yep. You want to go to the zoo? Let's go. How about, can you get that, please? Get. Yep. You could do get, you could do get please. This please on here, sorry, I didn't even notice. Um, yeah, get, let's get it. Can you get it? Again, let's open your lunchbox. Can you open your lunchbox? But, so just we're learning those core words and I'm gonna give you a bunch of resources for learning core words, which I absolutely love. Um, open, yes, Michelle, open. And then put your toys in the box would be, Put in, right, good. Put your toys in that box. And then are you finished? And then of course finished is on here. Are you finished? Are you done? Sorry, I need to check the chat. Question, my daughter's school speech therapist and teacher won't use AAC to model despite my several asks and discussions. Their argument is she didn't even touch the device and made a sound. I explained to them how modeling and repeating sentence helps her to babble at home. They should do this, but how? Okay. I'm gonna have you ask you, that was a direct message, I'm sorry ask you to please email me and we'll put um, my email address up and we can give you ideas, but also you can um, go back to your AAC team and make sure that the teacher is part of that group and gets that um, instruction for modeling. Thanks, Liz. So visuals, I'm big on visuals, if you can't tell. My student understands everything I say, should I still use visuals? Yes. And that tiny bit says yes, but in purple. So visuals are really important for many, many reasons. So visuals are usually permanent. They're not like spoken words, which you just say and they disappear. Um, they allow time for language processing. They can be used as cues, as reminders. Um, and then they also really help, like here with the first then, they help prepare students for transitions or people for transitions. Um, visuals help people see what you mean. 
visuals, putting visuals up in your classroom or your practice, they're going to help all students. And then because they help with building that independence. And then visuals are transferable between environments and people. So if you have a visual checklist or a visual um, token board or whatever it is, they don't have an attitude, a tone, frustration, no disapproval, they're just there. And they can help reduce anxiety. And with our AAC learners, they can really help when they're um, learning the symbols and things like that to have visuals posted. They can even be of the actual symbols, whatever they are. So here are some visual support examples. Um, you know, daily schedule in the classroom, washing your hands, here's a visual timer, a first then board, just all different types of visuals. This AAC prompting hierarchy, I'm going to probably go through quickly in the interest of time, but basically when you're prompting someone that's learning AAC, you want to go from a least to most. Um, oh, I can't think of the word. You want to start with least, least prompting to most prompting because uh, you want them to be as independent as possible and you want, you know, you want that autonomous communication. So the first thing you want to do is motivate. What will the student be motivated to communicate for? So we're going to talk about different reinforcers in just a minute. Um, is it a first then schedule? Is it a first we're going to do this and then you can do this type of a thing? Um, waiting again our favorite thing, uh, giving the student time to process your request and formulate that response. If that doesn't work, you're gonna go on to gestures or you can do all of these things in the beginning and then back off. So you might wanna uh, direct their attention to the AAC device, move the device closer to them and wait expectantly. Um, you may wanna point, point to the specific icon and say, do you want to go? Point to the go icon. Ask a question. What do you think? Try to elicit a response. Uh, give a direction. You might want to say, um, oh, I want a cookie. Your turn. What do you want? Direct modeling. Modeling what you would expect them to say. I think you might want a cookie too. Do you want a cookie? Or whatever it is. And then if there's no response, um, this particular uh, handout said, you might want to ask them to put their hands on the table if they can. You might want to ready their hand by touching their elbow or supporting their wrist. Um, and then you might want to try increasing motivation or repeating that prompt cycle. And then um, always use aided language stimulation modeling. Speak AAC all day, every day. That's the way you're going to learn. So here are just some positive reinforcements, ideas. Everybody's so different. Um, some people are motivated by clapping and cheering, a high five pat on the back or a hug, thumbs up, uh, a desired activity sometimes, where it could be um, anything from um, playing a game or doing an activity to alone time and a short break, doing what they wanna do. Could be a sensory break, uh, offering praise. Some people use token boards, but here's an example of one, but I want to point out Please don't use them for correct language, but for effort and for participation. And then first then boards, you know what? Let's work on this and work on our language. And then you can play a game on the iPad for five minutes or whatever it is. Here's another token board. Quick video from Rachel Madel. And while that's queuing up, 
I want to tell you, she, um, I'm sure she's in the resources, but she is a fantastic uh, resource. Again, it's Rachel Madel, and she has a whole course on AAC that you can purchase that is so great. But here she When I'm coaching communication partners, I love to use the phrase, inspire, don't require. Children with complex communication needs spend most of their days being told what to do. Sit down, come here, don't touch. The last thing they need is a demand for communication. Instead, as adults, it's our responsibility to inspire children to communicate. If you think about what motivates us as adults to communicate, it's things that are interesting and exciting and weird and surprising and silly. Those are the types of activities we need to create for children because that's what will inspire a child to communicate in a way that's authentic and not artificial or scripted. My best sessions are the ones where kids are smiling and laughing from activities that are so awesome that kids are intrinsically motivated to communicate about them. It's in these moments that children learn the true power of language. So inspire, don't require, make it fun. Here's 10 cardinal rules for AAC implementation. You always want to support that motor planning. Again, you want to teach a variety of those communicative functions, not just, um, you know, show me this, show me that. Um, you're going to model a variety of language with a variety of people. You're going to prompt just enough, not too much. You want to focus on those core words. Strive for snug, which is spontaneous, novel utterance generation, which basically means what we're looking for our communicators to do is to basically be able to say what they want, when they want, how they want. Weaving literacy into every activity, the more, um, the better readers they are, the better. So they're going to be able to type out on a um, a keyboard, the words that maybe not be in their device, things like that. Uh, you want to start teaching those operational skills early. Um, be a caregiver coach and believe that children can and they will. And again, that this is from Rachel Madel. I knew I had her website in here, which is the lady we just saw. So I'm going to show you some resources that um, they're in your handouts, but I just wanted to point some of them out because they're um, they're great. So here is a resource for incorporating AAC at home. Uh, here's the link. It was free on teacherspayteachers.com. And this is just ideas. So allow for choice making. So an example would be here offering choices during the meal. So let the child choose between two different, you know, liquids or drinks, two different foods, where they're going to sit. Um, maybe what, what color cup or what size bowl they're going to eat from giving their input. And then here there's examples. Here's, uh, different ideas for requesting, commenting, and directing others actions. Kids love to be able to tell other people what to do. A year of core words. So practical AAC again, which you'll see many times um, in your resources, has this great free thing called a year of core words. And I just took an example um, of April, but when you click on the link, it will take you there. And depending on where your AAC speaker is at and what symbols and device they use. So this is with just actual words. This is using board maker PCS symbols, if that's what they use. You now have the symbols for those four words of the week or, or month. And then this is a print Kiromic system. This is what their symbols look like. So you have the materials in um, that match their system and what they use. Another great resource, whether or not you use Prolocotigo, Assistive Wear has a core word classroom that is free. And in that 
CoreWord Classroom, you can download, you just sign up for free. You can download their um, word of the week and categories you include, you can download core word boards, planners, um, word of the week planners, there's five minute fillers, there's core words at home, um, strategies and resources. It's amazing. I took a couple screenshots. So the core word of the week is like, here's the symbol for like, and then they give you examples. So um, here's some, a sentence examples using like needs and wants. I don't like it. I would like to do this. Getting and giving information. She doesn't like it. What do you like? Social interaction. I like to go. Uh, here's another one. This is their core words at home. This is words on the go. Um, in a car, on the train, just going for a walk, learning about what you see and where, where you are. So here's example of core words verbs, describing words, quantity, prepositions, questions, pronouns, and time. And then again, examples of ways to use it. And of course you guys can download it, but here's our go symbol. We're on the go. This is just another example. This is another lady, Caitlin Oser, and she she's an SLP. And she puts out uh, an AAC calendar that has four words that you can subscribe to and download. Boom cards. I don't know if any of you use boom cards as teachers or therapists, but these are a great way to practice those um, words. Uh, Hopefully I can get in. So you can subscribe to um, Boom Cards. Oh, I don't have my pin. Hang on just a second. All right. Just so you can see. So here's an example of one of the activities that you can do like with a student. So it's Bobby's birthday. He wants you to make your very own cupcake. So then you're working with the symbol and the word on. Put the wrapper on the cupcake. You do it. Where's the wrapper? It's Is it on or in the cupcake? It's on. Put the frosting on. So I just want to give you an idea of the example. And it just goes through different activities for distinguishing the word on from the word in. But there's all kinds of activities with boom cards. And of course, you can create your own. I wanted to make you aware of this awesome lady. Her name is Amanda Hartman. And she has some great videos on YouTube. Um, she works for Assistive Wear, which makes Pro the Proloquo products. But she tells stories in such an animated way. And she uses um, communication device and models so well. I just wanted you to be aware of her information because it's so great. If we do the boom card, do we use AAC at the same time? Um, you could, but the boom cards are actually teaching those symbols. So you might wanna just do the, the boom cards first and then maybe try that same symbol on afterwards on your device, but you could do it either way. Um, I'm gonna have you, we have, along with um, the copies of the PowerPoint, we have a ton of resources that we're sending to you. Um, more, more resources on AAC goal info, AAC implementation, AAC support tools, and then some free AAC project resources for low-tech things. These are some just some examples of things that are in there. And thank you all for hanging out with us. 
Um, we're glad to have you. I would like to ask you if you wouldn't mind filling out our webinar evaluation. And I would like to preface preface that with saying, if a question doesn't have anything to do with the webinar, please mark NA for us. And give me just a second. I think Liz is gonna put the link in the chat. She probably already has, she did, cause she's awesome. Here is our contact information. Feel free to email us. It's the best way to get a hold of us since we do work from home. Um, again, the, the website has great information and also our YouTube channel does have our pre recorded videos of our other webinars. And then I think somebody had raised their hand but I can't see. Michelle, go ahead and type in the chat if you have a question. And then Liz, you can stop the recording while we answer questions if you want. 